So ladies, let's uh let's continue talking about the digestive system. So girls, we left off looking at the parts of the system. I think we left off talking about uh how it's controlled through certain chemicals. I'm going to show you another chemical. I want you now. It's that chemical is not on this list, but I want you to tell me what you think this chemical does. Okay, so I'm going to slide down to another slide. <laughs> slide down to another slide. Um, and this right here. Okay, so uh, because I showed you yesterday, we talked about some chemicals that have you know have roles in digestion, right? So for example, if I said to you. What's the role of uh, salivary amylase? True or false? It helps break down protein. False. It helps break down what? Carbs, right? Uh, specifically, things like starch. So not, it wouldn't work on sugar because sugar is already broken down, right? It works on complex carbohydrates. We also talked about some other chemicals that control other things, like, for example, um, what does gastrin do? So when the stomach swells with food, gastrin is released and what does it do? It tells the stomach itself to release what chemical? Pepsin. Okay? Well, pepsinogen, which then becomes uh, pepsin. Show you another chemical that is uh, pretty important in digestion. Now you tell me what you think it does, okay? So, here's a picture of a mouse. Actually, two mice. Okay. So, the one on the left is normal. The one on the right is obviously bigger. Okay. Now, the one on the right is missing. It's either missing the gene or they've knocked it out. So, in genetics, when you hear the term that like a scientist has knocked out a gene, what they mean is they haven't like put on a boxing glove and, and knocked it out. What do you mean? They, they turned it off in some way, okay? The gene that was turned off or knocked out was a gene called leptin, which you could see highlighted uh, down here, okay? So this is a gene called uh, leptin. So the one on the right does not have, is not expressing this gene. What do you think leptin plays a role in then? What's that? It's, so what do, you, what do you notice is the difference in two? Much larger. So leptin actually plays a role in uh, telling you whether or not you're hungry. So, so when you have, when you're eating and you've had enough, leptin should tell your brain, stop eating. So if you're missing that signal because the gene doesn't work, it's off, then your brain doesn't know that you're, that you're not hungry. And your brain's always thinking that you're hungry. So you eat, overeat. Yeah. Uh, can't be good for you. I mean, a mouse that big would not survive in the wild because it would be caught by something and eaten, right? But in the, in the lab, you can do cool things like this and make mutant mice that have no leptin signal and you can see what the effect is. So you can see that leptin controls that hunger response. So when you you release leptin, your, your brain says, I'm not hungry anymore, I'm fine. So I just thought to show you another example of a kind of an interesting chemical. Okay, so we left off looking at um, this slide, which was on different chemicals. Okay. What I want to talk about today is, because uh, we said that the swollen intestine is what does the absorbing, right? Okay. So, let's talk about the small intestine. Okay. And here is a picture of those folds in the small intestine. Remember the small intestine has these uh, finger-like projections. Okay. They're called villi. And this is what it would look like. This is a diagram of it, okay? So, what happens in a small intestine? You said 
so nutrients get absorbed. So we talked about how nutrients are broken down. This was a slide that summarized it all. We talked about, um, if you remember, the breakdown of the different nutrients using chemicals, where it happens, right? When that is completely broken down, then the nutrients have to be absorbed. So this is where it gets absorbed in the things called VLI. Now, you'll notice they're bumpy. Why? Why are they bumpy? Why are they bumpy? Yeah, why are they bumpy? Yeah, it has to do with, so it's an important concept in biology. Anytime you see a feature that's bumpy or has lots of folds, the reason why you see that is because you want to increase the surface area. Now, the surface area determines how quickly you can bring stuff in. If you look at trees, the reason why they have so many branches and so many leaves is to have more surface area. So when you want higher surface area, folding things up is a really easy way to get big surface area. If you want to have lower surface area, flat is the way to go. Okay, Flat is the way to go. Not, not this. So this bumpy appearance gives you more surface area. So you can see, there's just think about this for a second. If this, if this was just flat, okay. Imagine the surface was just flat. So we can measure the surface area. You guys do this in math class, right? Measure the surface area, and what would it be? It'd be length times width, right? But now think about this. Now all of this surface is folded. So there's just way more area. So that things like nutrients have more room now to move through and into, into your body and to be absorbed, right? There's just more surface area, so it makes it more and more efficient. Yeah? There's more surface area, like, increases the Yes. So did you guys do, uh, with chemistry, the, the effects of surface area on reaction rates? You probably should have done it in grade 10. No? Yes, grade 10. So it was done in grade 10. And uh, surface area goes up, reaction rate goes up. That's why, going back to the picture with the snake, that's why a snake takes a long time to eat its food, because it's not chewed up into little pieces. So the food has very low surface area. When you chew something up into little pieces, it has more surface area. Uh, I'll give you an example. If I have a cube like this, right? What would the surface area of this cube be? How would you calculate it again? Length times width times, right, then times the six. But if I take that cube and I cut it in half, now what you have is you'll have a cube, right, it looks like this, and you'll have surface inside the cube that previously was not exposed. So the, the more you cut something up, the more surface area there is, the more things are exposed, the quicker things will happen. So digestion is a chemical reaction. And if you have more surface area, it just happens more quickly. So that's why a snake takes forever to eat something because or digest it because it's not chewing it up into little pieces. Okay. So here you feel like. Now, if you look at the picture of the villa, you'll notice that they're full of blood vessels. Where does the food, when we talk about food being absorbed, where is it going? It's going into your bloodstream, okay? So what we're going to do is going to talk about uh, how this works, okay? How are different nutrients absorbed? So I'm going to show you some animations because I think that's always the best way to understand this. So I'm actually going to pause this video. Okay, so I'm going to show you okay, how different, way, uh, different ways things get into a cell. Okay, And again, this is probably something that, I have, I'll be honest, I haven't taught grade 9 or 10 in a, in a while. So I can't remember if you guys still do this in grade 9 or 10. So 
when you introduced to the cell, uh, at some point you were introduced to things like diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. What, is that great, Pam? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So you guys understand the difference between active and passive transport? You guys remember? What's the difference? Passive is what? With a... So in this animation, is that happening? Okay, so if we were to reset... Well, you, uh, I don't need... Do I need to reset this animation? Can you, you can see there's way more on... There's way more molecules on top than there is on the bottom. This is the cell membrane. And the molecules want to move from high concentration to, to low concentration. That's just basic diffusion, right? And this is passive because the molecules are going to do this normally. Active transport is when you use a pump, when a cell spends energy to move something where it doesn't want to go. So the, the analogy I give my students, imagine you're on a hill, and you're on top of the hill, and you start rolling. Would you need to do anything? No, you would just roll down the hill, right? That's passive transport. Now, active transport is getting yourself up the hill. Would you just match, magically, if you know, you got to spend energy to move up the hill, right? This is something called facilitated diffusion because you can see the molecule just cannot cross the membrane anywhere. It actually has to travel through this protein. So this is a protein, so it would be encoded in a gene, all right? This protein, to me, kind of reminds me of like a turnstile. You know, when you're walking, you have those little uh, rotating things that you have to walk through, okay? So this allows, this is like the doorway, okay? Now, this does not require any energy. This is facilitated diffusion. So far, so good? Yes, because you can see there's no energy being spent in doing this. Okay, if we were to uh, reset the animation, which is just from the beginning. Oop, wrong one. Sorry. Glad I had the uh, uh, glucose transport. Sorry. You'll notice there's nothing inside right now, right? So they're going to want to move into the cell. This. Because we're going to talk about how things get into. We're talking about absorption today, okay? This is how fructose gets in. So fructose will get into a, a transporter that looks like this. Now I'm going to show you a different one, okay? And it's going to look, it's different because it's a different animation, but you'll see a similar idea, okay? So I'm going to show you this one. Now, this this is what's called a symporter because you'll see two things have to fit into it to make it work. Here, what's going in? Just one thing, right? Whatever that thing is, it could be fructose. It spits in and the door opens up. Now, look at this one. Let's take a look at how it works. So you'll see that this is a pump because it requires energy. So that's what this ATP stands for, energy. And you can see that it's pumping out something. What is it pumping out? What's Na plus? What's it pumping in? You're like, what's this? Okay, so let me, it's just the orientation. This is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell, okay? So if we reset the animation, you'll notice right now, there's a lot of sodium on the inside, and there's less on the outside. So the pump is going to pump out the sodium, and it's going to pump in the potassium. Okay, This is called a sodium-potassium pump. We're going to get to why in a second. And you'll see this in grade 12, particularly grade 12. You see this, this pump is actually very important in your body. It works in numerous areas. Uh, so right now you'll see that it's it exchanges sodium for potassium. Okay. So you can see the pump right now pumps out sodium while moving potassium in the opposite direction. What that does is it builds a high concentration of sodium on the outside. Now this doorway does not open unless 
sodium and glucose, which is the G, are both present. Okay, uh, that's what you're gonna. Uh, that's what you're gonna answer right now. Okay, what is the point of doing? Like, why not? Why not just do this? Right. This seems pretty simple, right? You have a doorway. So imagine that you eat something. This is your intestine wall. These are the walls of the cell. This is the outside. This is the inside. You eat something like sucrose. Your body will break it down into fructose and glucose. And the fructose is going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration through this doorway. That's easy. That's very easy to understand. Uh, why do we have these doorways? Because this molecule is just too big to squeeze its way through the cell membrane. Remember, the cell membrane will allow certain things to go through, but not everything. So we need doorways to get them in. But this is simple. This looks really complicated. Like, what's going on here, right? Why do we need to have, okay, we got a doorway, but this doorway requires two things to open it. The other one all required one. So we need sodium and glucose. But to make it work, we need this pump to do its magic first, right? Why? Like, what's the point of that? that? Not that. The advantage of this probably is faster, but the advantage of this is you can control this. See, in other words, if you don't want to open up the doorway, you just have to leave the pump off. This allows you to control this process. So it's just not happening at any time. In other words, what happens if this pump doesn't work? This doorway will not, even if the glucose is present, that doorway doesn't open because to get it to open, you need two things. You need the glucose and the sodium. And the sodium you control. You can control when you want to release it. So this, this is called secondary active transport. Okay? This part is active because it requires energy. This part doesn't require energy. Okay? So this is, this whole thing is called secondary active transport. The reason why I'm showing you this is because uh, glucose and fructose come in differently. So fructose requires passive transport, as you saw in the animation. It just comes in by itself through a doorway. But sodium, uh, glucose requires this that more complicated scenario where you have to have a pump. So here's the pump right here. Okay, you can see the pump. So here it is. This, by the way, this is the intestinal wall. So these are the cells. There's that pump. So you pump out the sodium. The sodium wants to come back in because it, there's a high concentration of it. But, but it can't come in unless it brings in glucose with it. So the glucose is actually brought in differently than the fructose. So this is called secondary active transport. This is just facilitated diffusion. Okay? And you can see it here in this picture too. So here is uh, sucrose. Sucrose is one part fructose and one part glucose. Starch is all glucose. So if you break down starch, the glucose will be brought in through this symporter. If you break down sucrose, the glucose goes through here, but the fructose comes directly in through a different, through a different doorway. Yeah, well, well, fruit has glucose and fructose, right? Yeah, but you will, fruit is a good source of fructose. Okay, let's look at some how some other nutrients are brought in, okay? So, amino acids are brought in the same way 
that glucose is brought in, which means it requires a what? A pump. Okay? So it's, it's, it's brought in using uh, secondary active transport. Calcium, it also requires an active transporter. So we bring in calcium, right? Do you know why we need calcium? Everyone says bones. You learn in grade 12, it's not for bones. A different reason. I've been lying to you this whole time. No, that's it. No, listen. You need calcium for bones, for sure. You need calcium for bones. But there are other roles that calcium plays uh, in your body that are more important than building bone and building teeth. The transporter. Huh? Your fetus. <laughs> yeah, I'm not talking about your fetus. I'm talking about you. The role of calcium in your body, not in your fetus's body, which I hope you don't have a fetus. Okay. I know, but what exactly does the calcium do in your body? What does that mean? It helps with the development of the bone. <laughs> no, I, it's not what I said. That, I said that's actually have the most important role for calcium. You know what? Okay, so these active transporters are used also to bring in calcium. So here's the thing: um, you guys, um, you've heard about vitamins, right? Yeah. Okay. So, do you know what a vitamin is? I mean, we use the term a lot, and I have a list here of vitamins. I believe it's towards... So, here's a list of vitamins. Okay, and you don't have to memorize vitamins. If not, I just want you to understand what a vitamin is, okay? Here are just some examples of vitamins, okay? Uh, like vitamin A for vision, vitamin D for bone, proper bone development, vitamin E, vitamin E, okay. You've heard of probably vitamins, the B's, the C's. Vitamins are, are organic molecules that help enzymes function. They help other proteins in your body work. So, for example, vitamin C helps build collagen because there's a, an, as a, as a protein in your body, an enzyme that makes collagen. Vitamin C helps that enzyme make collagen. So if the vitamin C is if your vitamin C is deficient, that enzyme can't make the collagen, and the collagen holds you together, so you'll literally start to fall apart. Can't make it. Can't make it. Can't make it. Yeah, so if you have, have you ever heard of the disease called scurvy, you'll start bleeding to death because the collagen helps hold blood vessels together. And people will start to experience symptoms of bleeding to death because without the collagen, things start to deteriorate. So vitamins help other proteins work. Okay? Minerals are not organic. Minerals are things like Sodium, these are elements, okay? Chlorine, uh, iron, but they have important roles too. Like we need iron to carry oxygen. We need calcium to build bone, but there are other roles that are more important, okay? So the reason why I'm telling you this is because we were talking about how things are brought into the body. And calcium needs a transporter, a pump, to get it in. Okay. This active transporter needs a special vitamin to make it work. I want to see if you guys can guess what vitamin is required to make this transporter work, because without this vitamin, you cannot properly absorb calcium. Which one do you think it is? D. Very good. Vitamin D. Okay. That's why they say it's important for you to get sun because the vitamin D, you can make it. Uh, your skin can produce it through a chemical reaction. 
Or you can get it through eating what? Yeah, probably, but more importantly, things like dairy, right? A lot of the milk is fortified with vitamin D. The cereals are fortified with vitamin D. Okay, so the vitamin D allows this transporter to bring in uh, the, the calcium. So without the vitamin D, this transporter can't be built. It doesn't work. Yeah. The added. Fortified means the added. No. Genetically modified means you change something about the genetics of the organism. Not MSG? That's monosodium glutamate. That's different. That's a type of salt. Yeah. What about fat? How's fat brought in? Because you, you can think about this. You use your, you use your, uh, your big, big brain, which takes one quarter of your energy. You have to understand that the blood is mostly made out of what? Water. Does fat and water mix very well? No. Okay, so we have, a, we have a problem then. If you digest lipids, how do lipids move in an environment that is basically water? Because oil and water, fat and water don't mix. So how do you move fat around your body? Okay, you have to move them through what's called a lipoprotein. protein, and the lipoprotein protein looks something like this. Actually, let me zoom into this one. So. Uh, this is how fat is transported. It's transported in a package. The package is, I'm going to use two terms, okay? See if you guys understand what these two terms are. The package is hydrophilic on the outside and hydrophobic on the inside. Wow. Okay. What do you think hydrophilic means? Hydrophilic means it loves water. So this, if you look at this picture here, this looks very... Now, take a look. You see this? You see this structure? The blue circle with these little squiggly lines? Where have you seen that before? Well, if you go to this animation, that's these guys. That's this. This is your cell membrane. Okay? So a membrane is hydrophilic on one side. So the circle represents hydrophilic, which means it likes water. The tails, which are made of fat, are hydrophobic and they're on the inside. If you look at that, this picture of the lipoprotein, the yellow is the hydrophobic tail. And the blue is the hydrophilic side. Now, the outside loves water. The inside hates water. So the fat is on the inside. So when you eat something and you want to move the fat around your body, the fat will be packaged in something like this. Okay? Now, there's different types of these. Okay? There are different types of lipoproteins that you may recognize from a medical perspective. Riza. We'll talk about that later. Okay? Hold on. So when you're moving around when you're moving around fat, and cholesterol would be something that you would move around too. Uh, you guys heard of like high density or good cholesterol and bad cholesterol? Okay. So here it is right here, okay? So the HDL would be what's called a, a high density lipoprotein. So this thing here is called a lipoprotein because it's made up of fat and protein. So the one that's high density is good for you. Now you guys know what density is, right? Okay. These ones are considered not so good for you. Now, who knows, maybe in five years they'll say it's not true, but... So when you hear about, like, if you go to the doctor and they say that your good cholesterol is elevated, they're talking about this, the HDLs. That means you have a lot of these. Now, why is that considered good? And why is a lot of this considered bad? 
you don't have to know this. Like you don't have to know this chart, but I'll show you really quickly. You see where it says VLDL here? You notice that this is coming away from the liver? That means that the contents are being moved away from the liver, traveling throughout your body. If you look at the one that says HDL, you'll notice that the contents are moving towards your liver. So the stuff that's in here, that's moving away from the liver, that means it's traveling all over your body. That means it's traveling through your arteries. What happens then, you'll see in the next, when we get to this section on uh, circulation, when the cholesterol is traveling through your body, it can form what are called plaques, and your arteries will narrow. And that's not good. But if you have a lot of HDL, that's not going all over your body. That's going to your liver. And then when, you, when stuff goes to your liver, your liver will metabolize it, detoxify it, that's a good thing. Okay, your liver cleans, cleans up a lot of the stuff in your body. So the reason why HDL is good for you, or high levels, is because you can see it's, it's bringing cholesterol to the liver, whereas VLDL is actually moving it away from the liver. Okay, so make sure you guys, because you're young, you guys shouldn't have any issues. Yeah. I don't know those people. <laughs> Every body type is a little bit different, right? Yeah. Yes. No, that's where you store your fat. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. Everyone's a little bit. Yeah, I know everything. That's right. Brisa. What was your question, Brisa? How do you what? How do you lose cholesterol? You might not. I think it's more diet than exercise. It's diet. <laughs> Because the cholesterol comes from certain, the, the cholesterol comes from certain types of fat. So your body can make it. So if you eat certain things that are high cholesterol or are certain types of fat that can be converted to cholesterol, then your cholesterol levels will go up. It depends on what you're eating. Yeah. So things that are low in fat have low cholesterol. But here's the thing. You'll learn more about this in grade 12. Having a low fat diet, but having a high sugar diet could still, could actually be worse. But well, that's a whole other topic. My diet is all food diet. If it, as long as it's in front of me, I'll eat it. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Seafood diet. <laughs> uh, okay. Last one we'll look at is iron absorption. Why do we need iron? To transport oxygen. Okay. Transport oxygen. Uh, because it's an important part of what? Hemoglobin. Of hemoglobin. Okay. So this is the way uh, iron gets in. Okay. You can see there's a special door. Again, you don't have to... I'm just showing you different ways of these things getting. You don't have to memorize these. Just, just understand that they don't all come in the same way. Okay, they come in differently. So here's the iron. You can see it's got its own doorway. Interestingly, it doesn't come in as iron three. It comes in as iron two charge and solubility. But again, you don't have to memorize any of that. Okay. Uh, all right, so those are some examples of different ways uh, iron gets in. Okay, let's talk about the different nutrients. So, why do we need carbs? Energy. Yep, very good. For energy, what else? Why do we need, what's fiber? Fiber is a type of carbohydrate that you cannot digest. 
So if you can't digest it, it means you don't absorb it. So that means it, it, yeah, so it helps move things. Right, it helps move things through your body. Then lipids. So here are the different nutrients of what they're used for. You can use it for energy. You could use it to make steroid hormones. What's an example of a steroid hormone? What would be an example of a steroid hormone? Muscle thick. But the, the word steroid can be used incorrectly because there are different types. A steroid is a hormone. There's different types of hormones that build muscle. So testosterone could be used to build muscle because it makes males look more like males. What would be the equivalent for females? Okay, very good. So lipids can be used for energy, but also to make uh, certain steroid, sorry, to make steroid hormones. And then we have your proteins. Why do we need proteins? Why do we need proteins? To make enzymes. You guys study what an enzyme is? We just studied them yesterday. All of these in blue are enzymes. What an enzyme does, an enzyme... You guys have like, the, uh, like a five second memory, eh? So the <laughs> enzymes are chemicals that help a chemical reaction proceed quickly, okay? So, for example, what's the chemical reaction that pepsin controls? It's protein to what are called short polypeptides. What's the chemical reaction that uh, maltase controls? It's maltose to glucose. Okay. You don't have to know the different reactions, right? But you do need to know what they do uh, like in terms of like how they, like what an enzyme is. So, like for example, you do need to know that maltase and lactase and sucrase break down sugar. Okay, so you need to understand that. Um, no, that's not my problem. I already have my education. So, <laughs> so proteins are used to make enzymes. Proteins are also used to make muscle. They're used to make certain hormones because not all the hormones are made from fat. Some are made from protein, like insulin. Okay. Uh, here is how amino acids are used in your body. So you could see that they could be used for energy. That's what this fancy term is. You'll learn about this in grade 12. That's a plug for grade 12. Okay. Yeah. You can see that it can also be converted into fat. Or it could be converted into building things like myosin, which is involved in muscles and muscle contraction, or hemoglobin. I thought I had a slide here for fat. Oh, yeah, here's fat. Fat, you can see, could be used for, you can see, could be used for energy. So that's what this means. Or it could be converted into basically more fat. So you can store your fat as, as fat. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so the fatty acid would be this tail component. <laughs> it's a string of carbon and hydrogen. I can show you that later what it looks like. No, I'll show you that after the presentation. Okay, uh, show you some examples of diseases and disorders when it comes to digestion. So this is a picture of colon cancer. You can see the tumor right here. Okay. 
Uh, we talked about cardiovascular disease and some, okay, here is actually a picture of salmonella. Now, what's the problem with salmonella? From what? Okay, so these are all things that are, could affect your digestive system. This is, anyone recognize this? <laughs> this is something called H. pylori. H. pylori is what causes uh, stomach ass. Uh, sorry, stomach ulcers. Okay, so stomach uh, stomach ulcers were thought to be caused by stress. Now, whenever an ulcer is when an ulcer is when the mucus lining deteriorates and the acid goes through the stomach. So it was thought that it was just stress, but we later discovered that it was actually a bacterium that causes this condition. Yep. So maybe what the stress could do, I suspect, is maybe it makes it easy for this bacteria to flourish and grow. Right? So it's not the actual stress that's causing the ulcer, but there's a connection there. Yep. Uh, also eating the wrong things. Yeah, so if you have stomach ulcers, you have to watch certain things like coffee, spicy food, because apparently that aggravates it. Yeah. Sorry? When there's a hole. Oh. That I don't know. Something. Okay. Now, so are you guys okay then if we kind of just wrap this up? Yes. <laughs> I'm actually missing my picture of washer core. Yeah, but why is it not here anymore? Must have deleted it by accident. <laughs> Washer core. I'll, I'll talk about that at another point. Okay, so are you guys okay with like knowing what the different parts of the system do? Okay. So, uh, I have the answers up. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, put this in order, but it already is in order. So this is basically like something I could ask you on a test or quiz. Yeah, can you believe that? Where they go, Dominique? So I want you guys to know the order of the system. I want you guys to know like what each part does. I want you to know some of the roles of the chemicals. Uh, I want you to know how. Some different examples of the ways things get in. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Isn't it like amylase? Amylase. Yeah. Yeah. So, so if you think about the order, where's, where's salivary amylase? Why? Where is it? It's in your mouth, right? And then the food goes into the mouth to esophagus, then esophagus into stomach. So this is the hormone gastrin that gets released. Gastrin controls the release of pepsin. Pepsin then breaks down the protein, right? And, and others, it, it only works on protein, but there's obviously other stuff in the stomach that eventually moves to the small intestine. When it moves to the small intestine, secretin, secretin triggers the release of things from the pancreas, right? Like lipase or the gallbladder, like bile or sodium bicarbonate, which is also from the pancreas. So these things are simultaneous. That's why it's 555. And then once the food is broken down, the glucose is absorbed through the sodium glucose transporter. 
And then whatever doesn't get absorbed goes to the large intestine where the water is reabsorbed. Okay? All right? Okay, guys, why don't we stop there? That's a wrap. That's a wrap.